Moderna is betting bet on artificial intelligence. The biotech company has joined forces with the creators of ChatGPT, OpenAI, to expand its employees' access to AI chatbots. Joining us right now to talk about the AI medicine revolution is former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb. He is also a CNBC contributor, and he serves on the boards <clears throat> of Illumina and Pfizer. And, Dr. Gottlieb, we should point out that you're an expert yourself in this. You're launching your own company this week, Zyra, which is an AI-based drug developer that you all have raised a billion dollars for. Right, backed by New Enterprise Associates, a venture capital firm where I'm, where I'm a partner. Look, I think that the drug developers have been making use of AI tools for a very long time. If we look back even 20 years ago, they were making use of machine learning to do in silico drug design, basically design molecules on computers and also using modeling and simulation to do dose finding. What's different now is the use of large language models, not just for uh, enterprise-level SGNA functions, but also in the drug discovery and drug development process. And so you're seeing the large drug makers try to get instances of large language models within their own ecosystem so they can now load their own data on it and use it in a proprietary fashion. I've seen a lot of drug makers uh, partnering with Microsoft. It's interesting to see them also partnering with uh, OpenAI to do the same thing. I think the, the real next inflection point is going to be when you can build very high quality clinical data training sets to design models that are purposely built to solve for human biology. Right now we're using models that are borrowed from the consumer tech world, so they're not, they haven't been built to solve for human biology and we don't really have good clinical data training sets. And that's the goal of the startup that we're, we're funding, is to try to build models that are purposely built for biology. Meaning models that are based on biology itself or models that are based on studies that have been done over 15, 20 years um, on all kinds of ways that these things play out? Like, how does it actually work? Yeah, both. I mean, what, what's happening now is a lot of the data that we have to train models on. First of all, we're using consumer tech models. And then the data we, that we have to train those models on hasn't necessarily been collected in a fashion where it's optimized for training an artificial intelligence model, a large language model. So you might have proteomic or genomic data, but it's not correlated with phenotypes. Yeah. What we're going to try to do is do large-scale experimentation where we basically do perturbations at a very large scale. So think of um, changing genes and, and trying to figure out how it correlates with different phenotypes in the human body. So we have technology to do that. And when you do that at a very large scale, and you might even change genes in ways that don't exist in nature, you start to get a really good sense of the biology of different systems within the bot body, and then you can both build a model based on that information and train it more adequately. Because so many of these clinical tests fail in the phase two, phase three studies on this, it shows great promise, but you can't get through the requirements that these tests are showed. You think we'll have better ability to more quickly uh, get drugs to market? I think we're both. I think, first of all, these tools are being used in different portions of the drug development process to try to bring efficiency. So something as simple as trying to pull together the application that you're filing with the agency or looking at post-market data to monitor for adverse events and try to figure out causality from signals that you're identifying in the market. But it's also going to allow us, if we can truly understand biology of different systems and different disease states, it might allow us to identify targets that we wouldn't have perceived otherwise because we might see something adjacent to where we were looking that's also impacting a disease state that the model's pointing us to. And then to design drugs that we might not have been able to do experimentally. So Zyra, the company I'm involved with, is going after protein-based drugs first and foremost. That's going to be the first target. Right now, for antibody drugs, we use experimental models like mice, where we have mice that replicate human immune systems, and we right. basically try to get the mice to produce antibodies and extract them. So it's a hit or miss process. Using an AI model, and this technology has been developed uh, by David Baker at University of Washington, who's also a co-founder of the company. Using this model, you can try to design antibodies intelligently that bind to protein targets that you might not have been able to get antibodies to bind to before. because. Uh, antibodies are the sum of small interactions, and sometimes it's very hard to figure out how to design an antibody to bind to certain targets if you can't get a mouse to produce that particular antibody you can't isolate it from a person. How long before you actually see this stuff? helping in the marketplace? Well, we're, we're seeing it already. I mean, other companies are already using these tools. I think, again, I think the inflection point is going to be when you do things more 
deliberately when you, when you, instead of borrowing some of the models that have been developed for more of a technological application, you can actually develop models that are based on human biology and based on training sets that were built for the purpose of designing new models. And that's happening right now. You see things like what David Baker built, RF diffusion, which allows you to um, design antibodies to bind to different targets. You've seen what Google did with AlphaFold, which allows you to model um, the, develop, the structure of an antibody. So we're seeing these tools being used already in drug development. But I think we're still at the early stages of this, because we haven't done it in a deliberate fashion. Scott, I mean, <clears throat> you think about metabolism and you think about all these processes, and, and we've been lucky uh, at different times to find things that one gene could, you know, it's got a mutation, go in and fix it somehow. But gene therapy and working on one gene is very rare. What, what, how many genes are involved in most diseases or, or conditions? Hundreds, thousands, or... Yeah, you're getting, you're getting right to the point. Which is I mean, why AI, right, exactly. The, the only way to understand it, the, the, the total picture of what you're doing and designing drugs to address it, it's, and for, I think about 15 years ago, up at the, the cancer center at MIT, they got rid of the guy that, who was running it and put in like a data guy, almost a, an IT guy, because that right. the convergence of That is of the, the point. Not only, now you can look inside systems, the model might tell you different, different elements of biology that are all impacting a disease state. You might be able to target it with one drug, so you design a protein drug to hit multiple targets. Right. Or you might be able to design multiple drugs and provide them in combination that you might not have perceived otherwise without the model being able to give you a much clearer picture of what the biology of the, is of the disease. Because we're, we're focused in. We try to narrow our focus to try to find one causative feature of disease and then target that with a drug. That's never historically happened. how we've done it. Yeah. That's not how diseases arise. No, never happens. Scott, very quickly before you go, um, a lot of consumer concern about avian flu being detected in, in milk, in the nation's milk supply. Should I be concerned about drinking this? What's the impact? No, you shouldn't be concerned. So what they're detecting is viral remnants of heat, heat inactivated virus. And there's no reason to believe the pasteurization process. First of all, I wouldn't drink raw milk. I would never drink raw milk. I wouldn't drink it now. There's no reason to believe the pasteurization process isn't going to kill this virus. And if, if, in fact, they found live virus in milk, and I don't think they will, but if they did and they're looking, I'd be more inclined to believe it came through the bottling process and contamination on packaging than coming through the pasteurization process. What this shows you, though, this, the reason why FDA and CDC did this testing of milk is that, the, that USDA and APHIS and state regulators wouldn't allow them on the farms to do more widespread testing because they didn't really want to turn over those cases. And so this is a backdoor way to do on-farm testing. Instead of testing the cows, you test the milk. And what we're finding is this virus is much more pervasive on dairy farms right now than what we originally perceived. And so that's unfortunate. Is that a scary thing that it could jump? It's unfortunate because the more that we allow this to spread in man mammals, the more we're tempting fate that this could evolve in ways that it could threaten humans. And they're not letting people on because they don't want to call the herds? This is a historical problem. So when I had outbreaks of E. coli in romaine lettuce, I was, my inspectors weren't allowed onto the farms initially, so I sent the inspectors to test the adjacent farms, the water running off from the farms that I thought the E. coli was coming from. There's always been a tension between human health people who would want to swab everything and animal health people who are worried about some of the economic implications and don't want federal inspectors on their farms. And you're seeing that play out here as well. This is a very clever move by CDC and FDA to test the milk as a way to identify which farms have outbreaks. Hopefully it forces the hands of agricultural officials to allow more broad, broad testing. Can I get any immunity from the milk, from the fragments no. of the H1? How do you know? You're not going to get immunity from fragments of What? Of what if it's a spike protein? What if I got a <laughs> spike protein from an H1N1? Because it would have to be transcribed. And it would have to be transcribed into the protein. The protein itself would probably be inactivated. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I it's think I can, I'm going to keep eating um, <laughs> frosted flakes. You know, there's a vaccine. There's also antiviral drugs for this particular strain.